Okay, so in the last lecture we did some review on the Bode plot and the frequency response function and we had just started to understand how to transfer the information from the Bode plot into the S-plane to construct the corresponding Nyquist plot. Um, you'll recall that we took a pretty basic example, the transfer function 1 over S plus 1. We reviewed how to sketch the Bode plot for that. So we have the magnitude plot as well as a phase plot. And then through sort of frequency by frequency analysis, we are able to plot data points on the S-plane where the magnitude represents uh, the distance from the origin, the phase represents a phase angle from uh, the positive real axis, and we're able to construct enough points so that we can essentially connect um, the dots and produce the contour in the S-plane called the Nyquist plot. One of the things that we learned is that the Bode plot, as you can see, only gives you frequencies from uh, small values of, small positive values of omega all the way up through positive infinity. So we denote those frequencies by using the zero plus through positive infinity. Uh, so the, the Bode plot itself only gives you one half of the Nyquist plot. The Nyquist plot itself has to be a closed contour by nature. So we mirror about the real axis to get the second half which constitutes all frequencies from minus infinity up to zero minus. Uh, what's very important here is to note those four key frequencies, zero plus and minus, plus and minus infinity, as well as a direction of increasing omega, as that is going to be a key uh, factor when we talk about the Nyquist stability criterion a little bit later this lecture. What I want to do before we start talking about that is to give you a second method to sketch the Nyquist plot. Okay, so the Nyquist plot using method one, which is what we picked up last lecture, essentially essentially requires you to have a very accurate Bode plot in order to sketch the Nyquist plot. Uh, and then once you have the Bode plot, you transfer that information over, and then you've got your Nyquist plot. The second method actually doesn't require you to have the Bode plot. Uh, we take a more analytical approach and we consider the frequency response function itself. Uh, so we don't actually need to sketch the Bode plot first in order to get the Nyquist plot if we can go through some analysis in the frequency domain. So we'll call this the no Bode plot method. And we'll take a look at the very same example we looked at last time. 1 over s plus 1, and we'll see if we can come up with the same Nyquist plot using this method rather than the Bode plot method. Okay, so like I said, we're going to consider the frequency response function, which you get by plugging in j omega everywhere you see s into the transfer function. So we're going to be looking at the frequency response function L of j omega as 1 over, now there's an s here, so I'll plug in j omega plus 1. Sometimes I prefer to write this as 1 plus omega j, just because it's very clear that this is sort of a uh, uh, complex number in our traditional form, real plus imaginary. Okay. Um, the idea now is that this frequency response function, the frequency response function itself, is a complex valued function. You can see there's a j in there, right? So it's a complex valued function, its domain is the complex s-plane. Okay, um, the idea is we can express complex value, uh, complex valued functions in a number of different ways. If you do a quick review of your complex number theory, for some arbitrary uh, complex value, you can express that as. Of course, you can express that as uh, alpha plus j beta, or you can express it in exponential form, where the distance from the origin is r, and the angle measured from a positive real is theta. So we can also express this value s in the complex plane as r e to the j theta. Now this is just expressing the same value but in exponential form. And so what we're going to do is convert this complex valued function, right, it's not just a value in the s-plane, it's an entire function, but we can also express this in exponential form. What that means is everywhere you see a complex value, like 1 plus omega j, you're going to replace that with 
uh, an arbitrary exponential form as a placeholder. Okay, what that means is L of j omega will now be written as, okay, so I've got 1 over, here's a complex value, 1 plus omega j. I'm just going to replace that by R e to the j theta. Okay, so just replace one complex number uh, with a different form of a complex number. Okay, once we do that, for all, for anywhere you see a complex value in your frequency response function, um, it, once you complete that, then you take your overall uh, frequency response function and you write it in exponential form. In other words, I can factor out, uh, I can factor out the one over r, and I want the form to look like uh, some value times e to the j, uh, some phase angle. Right, so I can move this exponential up into the numerator if I change the sign of the exponent. So I'll make this equal to minus theta. All right, so what I've done is I've written the entire frequency response function in exponential form, like so. And this is going to be useful later because, as you know, the Bode plot itself is nothing more than a plot of the magnitude and the phase of that function. Okay, so, so what we've done here is essentially we've given ourselves uh, an analytical version, like sort of a, an analytical function for the magnitude of L of j omega as well as the phase of L of j omega. Okay, so but now instead of doing it in Bode plot form, we've got it in uh, analytical form. Okay, so the next step here is we're going to leave this, we're going to sort of leave this um, frequency response function uh, for the moment. And then what we're going to do is we're going to make a little table. We're going to make a little sort of uh, secondary contour here, secondary s-plane, like so. And we're going to plot all the poles and zeros of the original L of s. So we only have one pole at negative 1 here. Right? And we're going to call this, uh, we're going to call this contour A. Right? And this, it'll be apparent why I'm calling this S-plane contour A, uh, because the Nyquist plot, we're going to call that contour B. And you have to realize that these are going to be two separate S-planes. Okay? Nonetheless, what you do is you plot all the poles and zeros of your, your L of S, and then put a point, it's some arbitrary point on the imaginary axis. And then you're going to draw rays from all of your poles and zeros to that common point on the imaginary axis. Okay, and by our definition, okay, so the, the pole at negative 1, we associated that with the exponential version r e to the j theta. So this distance from this pole to that arbitrary point, we're going to call that r. And then this angle, we're going to call that theta. Once you do that for all of the poles and zeros, to the left or to the side of this, uh, what we're going to call a contour, we're going to make a little table, and the table is going to uh, tabulate a couple of things. It's going to tell us what the r's and the thetas are for all of those values, right? In, in future examples, we're going to have multiple r's and multiple thetas, so we're going to see what those do as omega is increased from zero plus all the way up to positive infinity. And what that means is we're essentially going to take this sort of point on the imaginary axis and pretend that we slide it from, we're going to slide it from 0 plus, which is way down close to the origin, right? Remember the imaginary axis is otherwise known as the J omega axis, where omega is the frequency uh, argument in the frequency response function, okay? so. When omega is very close to zero, yet still slightly positive, that means this point is slid down very close to the origin. And then we're going to slide this point all the way up the imaginary axis to infinity. Uh, and that's going to capture the full spectrum of frequencies, just like the Bode plot does. Okay? Uh, only, in this case, we're keeping track of what's happening with the r and the theta value. Okay, so you can imagine if this point is slid way down close to the origin, then the r value, the distance from the pole to that arbitrary point, is about 1, because we're going from a value of negative 1, essentially, to the origin. So the magnitude is going to be 1, and at that same time, this phase angle is practically 0 degrees, because we're at a horizontal line. 
as you take this point and you slide it up the imaginary axis, right? We're going to slide it up basically until infinity. You're going to find that the magnitude of that r approaches infinity and the phase angle approaches 90 degrees. Right? So it's that point is just going more and more vertical, so that angle theta approaches 90 degrees. You're going to do the same uh, sort of exercise for all of the r's and r all of the thetas in your particular system. And once you're done, you're going to draw a line and construct two additional rows. And those rows are going to be, one is for the magnitude and another is for the phase angle. And this is where you're going to revisit your uh, frequency response function written in exponential form. Because remember, we developed an analytical form for the magnitude and an analytical form for the phase. Okay, So the magnitude of L is equal to 1 over R according to our uh, exponential version of the frequency response function. And 1 over R, when omega is close to 0, gives us 1 over 1 which is 1. As we slide the frequencies up to infinity, r approaches infinity, which means that the magnitude, which is 1 over r, should approach 0. Okay? The same thing can be done for the phase. The phase function is given as negative of theta. So when omega is close to 0, negative 0 <coughs> is basically still 0. However, as we slide that frequency up to infinity, the phase approaches negative of theta, so negative 90 degrees. Once we have these two rows, we can then sketch the Nyquist plot because we have essentially the same information that the Bode plot told us. It's just that we've got it in analytical form now. Okay, what I mean by that is by using these bottom two rows, we can we can sketch our Nyquist plot. Sketch our Nyquist axes, I'm sorry. Which is in the S-plane, which by the way we're going to start calling the B contour. Right? So the A contour is sort of where we map all of our poles and zeros of the L transfer function, and the B contour is where we actually sketch our Nyquist plot. Okay, they're two separate S-planes. Nonetheless, we can start by looking at the frequency close to zero, we have a magnitude of one, so distance from the origin of one, at a phase angle of zero. Okay, what that looks like here is magnitude of one, phase angle of zero, which puts us right on the real axis at a value of one, right? Now the rest of it, so the rest of it, you, can, you kind of got to keep track of the magnitude and the phase at the same time. Okay, so what I mean by that is, as the frequency uh, uh, pans from zero plus all the way up to positive infinity, the distance from the origin is going to approach zero, while at the same time the phase angle is going to go from zero to negative 90. Okay, so as you're, as you're sort of mentally sweeping through that range of frequencies, you've got to keep track of both the magnitude and phase at the same time. So it's as though, okay, so we can take an intermediate frequency, say, I don't know, maybe this is somewhere be, this is somewhere between zero and infinity. We might be at a phase angle of negative 45, uh, and, and at that angle we're going to be somewhere between a magnitude of one and zero. So we're not going to be at one, we're going to be somewhere between one and zero. And we're basically just going to pan this angle from zero to negative 90, and realize that at the same time, the magnitude is shrinking from 1 to 0. Okay, so if you have sort of like, if you've got like a, a stick or a straight line, you can kind of do this in real time. You can sort of sweep through the angle from 0 to negative 90, and at the same time slide your pen along that uh, stick from a value of 1 to 0, and what you're going to find is you will trace out the shape of the Nyquist plot. Uh, it's going to end up looking like like this, just like we had before. Okay. Like so. Okay, and of course what this um, what this covers is the frequencies from 
the frequencies from zero plus up to positive infinity. So just like before, we need to label where those frequencies are. So zero plus, we're going to sweep through the frequencies up to positive infinity. And just like in the first method, we have the first half of the Nyquist plot. We need to mirror that to get the second half. This would be our frequencies from minus infinity up to zero minus. And this is our complete Nyquist plot. Notice that we didn't uh, we didn't have a need to sketch the Bode plot. We went straight from the frequency response function to the Nyquist plot without ever needing to sketch the Bode plot. Okay, uh, if you notice, this should match up very well with our method one Nyquist plot. This is sort of a circle uh, with you know endpoint at one and at the origin that kind of goes in this clockwise circle. So this is a basic method for sketching the Nyquist plot without a Bode plot, okay? And 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 just to re, uh, just to review, basically your your steps are to create the frequency response function, write it in exponential form, so that you can extract the magnitude and the phase functions analytically, and then do this business of sketching this a contour where you actually can see what happens. Um, as frequencies go from 0 plus, which is when this point is way down close to the origin, all the way up to positive infinity, right? which is basically just means sliding that point up the j omega axis, which again is the same information that the Bode plot gives you. As you tabulate what's going on with all those r's and thetas, um, you, you can keep track of those with this table, and then when you're finished, you're going to employ those two functions that you previously derived, the magnitude and the phase. Once you've got these bottom two rows, it's a matter of sort of visualizing what's happening as you as you pan through that range of frequencies. So keep track of both the magnitude and the phase simultaneously, and that will allow you to sketch the Nyquist plot. Okay, so now that we have the basic, uh, sort of the basic process out of the way, we can apply this this method to uh, a slightly more complicated example. We'll look at another example that's 6 times s plus 1 over s minus 1, s minus 2. Okay, so we can apply the same process here. Um, it's just a little bit more involved, but the process remains identical. And so we, we can sketch the Nyquist plot for this relatively complicated transfer function, hopefully very uh, in a very straightforward manner using this method. Okay, again, the first thing we have to do is to come up with the frequency response function, which means to plug in j omega everywhere we see s. So we've got 6 times j omega plus 1 over j omega minus 1 times j omega minus 2. Right? This by itself becomes the complex valued frequency response function. Uh, but remember, we want to write this in exponential form, right? So what that means is everywhere we see a complex number, like j omega plus 1 or j omega minus 1, we want to replace that with an exponential uh, counterpart. So all we're doing in this step is rewriting the original frequency response function as r e to the j theta. But because we're going to have several of these, we'd better subscript them. So we'll call this r1 e to the j theta 1. And there's two complex values in the denominator. So we can call that r2 e to the j theta 2 and r3 e to the j theta 3. Okay, so we've, we've replaced all of our sort of Cartesian um, uh, uh, versions of the complex values with these exponential versions. And then f the final step is to factor all of these magnitudes out and write this thing as one big exponential function. So basically what I'm saying is write it as something times e to the j something else. Right? That's the form that we want to get this in. And so we can factor out all the magnitudes, which leaves us with 6r1 over r2 r3 times e to the j. Now combining all these exponential functions, you remember that you add the exponents to combine them. So we've got theta1 in the numerator, but we want to bring this theta 2 and these theta 3 into the numerator as well, so we're going to change the sign, like so. 
Okay, so theta 1 minus theta 2 minus theta 3 is the effective overall phase for this frequency response function. And like, like before, what we're going to do at this point is we're just going to sort of let this sit, right? Let this guy just sort of marinate for a minute. And we're going to recognize that we've developed an analytical uh, form for the magnitude and the phase of this L of j omega, okay? What we're going to do next is we're going to sketch out our A contour. Our A contour consists of a very basic uh, S-plane. And this is where we're going to do our so-called mapping. Uh, what we need to do is plot all the poles and zeros of our original L of S. So we've got uh, a stable zero at negative 1, unstable pole at 1, and an unstable pole at 2. Remember what we need to do now is to draw some arbitrary point on the uh, imaginary axis and sketch rays from our poles and zeros to that common uh, point on the imaginary axis. Okay. Now what we want to do is label all of our r's and thetas on this plot, but we want to be very careful to label them according to our notation. In other words, the stable zero at negative one, that was j omega plus one, we referred to that as r1 e to the j theta one. So this ray better be labeled r1, and this angle here better be labeled theta one to keep things consistent. The same is true for the other two unstable poles. The unstable pole at one, we call that r2 e to the j theta two. So this distance here, we'll call that r2. Uh, another subtle point is the angle is always measured from the positive real. So this is not theta 2, right? Rather, this angle here measured from the positive real is our theta 2. Okay, and so R3, theta 3, again measured from the positive real. This would complete our A contour. Once we're finished sketching the A contour, we're going to tabulate what happens as omega goes from 0 plus all the way up to positive infinity, like so. But remember, we need to keep track of all of our r's and all of our thetas. So there's several of them this time. Okay, So we've got r1, r2, and r3, theta1, theta2, theta3. Okay, We need to keep track of all of these parameters as the frequency goes from 0 plus to positive infinity which on this A contour is indicated by pretending that this point starts way down close to the origin and is slid up all the way up the imaginary axis uh, up to positive infinity. Right? That should capture all of our positive frequencies. Uh, and so to do that we just imagine that first this point is all the way by the origin and at that point R1, the distance R1, not, right, so we're just looking at the magnitude, the distance is 1 and not negative 1, right? So it's going from a value of negative 1 to 0, but the distance is 1. R2 is also 1, and R3 is a value of 2. As we slide that point all the way up to infinity, all of those magnitudes, or all of those, those rays, approach a length of infinity. So this portion of the table is relatively straightforward. Uh, bringing this point, sliding it all the way back down to the origin again, we can see that theta 1 starts at about 0 degrees, and theta 2 and theta 3 both start at 180 degrees, so 180 degrees. And then, as we slide that point all the way up to infinity, all of those angles approach 90 degrees. Right? All of those rays are, for, for, for better or worse, practically vertical by the time this point gets up to infinity. Okay. Once we're done tabulating all of our r's and thetas, the next step is to draw a line. And now we're going to actually uh, employ our magnitude and phase functions that we de uh, derived earlier. Okay, so the magnitude of L is 6r1 over r2, r3. And that's true through the range of this, uh, the frequency spectrum. Okay, so when frequency is close to 0 plus, we've got 6 times 1 over 1 times 2, which is 3. As we approach infinity, 
as we approach infinity, we get 6 times infinity over infinity squared. Well, that's a little bit strange. You may, you may wonder uh, if that's one of these um, indeterminate forms where we're going to have to then apply L'Hopital's rule back from calculus. Um, but I can ease your mind here in, in saying that um, L'Hopital's rule is only for when you are uncertain about the nature of the so-called value of infinity. Uh, in this case, however, these r's, these represent distances to a common point on the imaginary axis from a common axis, right? So if r1 approaches infinity, r2 approaches infinity at the same rate, right? So in that sense, and only in this sense, where we know something about the nature of those infinities, can we actually cancel infinities, so to speak, right? In other words, if r1 is 10 billion, r2 is 10 billion, then we know that 6 times 10 billion over 10 billion, we can cancel, the, cancel those 10 billions out, right? So ultimately, we, w uh, what we end up with is a 6 over some humongous number, which ultimately will uh, converge to 0. Okay, so, so in this case, fortunately, we don't have to apply the L'Hopital's rule because, again, we know something about the nature of these infinite values. Okay, so we go from a magnitude of 3 down to 0. For the phases, okay, when this point is down close to the origin, again, we've got 0, 180 for theta 2, 180 for theta 3, but the function that we apply is the one that we derived up here. So it's theta 1 minus theta 2 minus theta 3 turns out to be the phase function, okay? So 0 minus 180 minus another 180, that's minus 360 degrees. Uh, don't be tempted to replace this with the, the equivalent value of 0, uh, because in this special case they are actually not equivalent, and I'll show you why in just a sec. Okay, uh, Applying the same formula, theta 1 minus theta 2 minus theta 3, when omega approaches infinity, we have 90 minus 90, which is 0, minus another 90, which gives us negative 90. Okay. Uh, the reason I don't want you to replace any values with what you think is their equivalent is for the following reason. Okay, what's important here, actually, in the phase line is, is uh, determining what direction of rotation this is going to yield. What I mean by that is, to get from negative 360 to negative 90, what direction are we actually rotating? Uh, to visualize that, you can just look at where negative 360 exists on the sort of uh, xy plane. Negative 360 exists here on the positive real axis, but it's only because we've sort of pre-wound from 0 to negative 90 to negative 180 to negative 270 back to negative 360. So this is negative 360 degrees here. Negative 90, on the other hand, is just here, right? So we go from 0 to negative 90. Right? But to get from negative 360 to negative 90, we don't go we don't go in this direction, right? We actually if we're starting here, we actually have to backtrack this way to get to negative 90. And that's the key difference here because in one analysis, going from 0 to negative 90, that's a clockwise rotation, whereas the proper uh, 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 method would be, uh, the proper interpretation would be to say from minus 360 to minus 90, that's actually counterclockwise rotation. Okay, so this is actually going to be a counterclockwise uh, rotation, which is very important to write in these bottom two rows, indicate the direction of uh, rotation, uh, because that's going to completely dictate the shape of your Nyquist plot. If this was confusing, and I know it always is, uh, one a different way to think about this is to eliminate the degrees, right? If if you're looking at the number negative 360 and the number negative 90 on the number line, right? So negative 360 is here, negative 90 is here, and zero is here. To get from this value here to this value here you have to add numbers, right? You've got to add numbers to negative 360 to get up to negative 90. 
Well, if those numbers now represent angles and degrees, adding angles and degrees always indicates that we're kind of going in a counterclockwise fashion, right? So that's another way to think about it. Um, and again, you'll get the same result that we're going in a counterclockwise fashion. Okay, so it's very important to indicate the direction of rotation here so that we get a complete and accurate picture of what the magnitude and phase are doing as we span from zero, uh, omega equals zero up to infinity, okay? Again, however, once we establish these bottom two rows, we are now ready to sketch the Nyquist plot. Okay? And this Nyquist plot is going to look like, well, it'll, it's going to look a little bit different from the, from the previous example. Uh, the way to approach this one is, again, look, you kind of have to just stare at both the magnitude and phase uh, for a while to get a sense for what each one is doing. The magnitude is going to start from a distance of the or, uh, from the origin of 3, and it's going to shrink to 0, as we can see here. Right? So the Nyquist plot is going to end at the origin, uh, as it often does, and it's going to start uh, at a distance of 3. It's going to span through an angle of minus 360 up to negative 90 in a counterclockwise fashion. Right? So this is kind of the key. So minus 360 exists here on the real axis, and we're going to plot this point of 3 right here because we're at a magnitude of 3, phase angle of minus 360. But to get to minus 90, we are not going to go this way. Right? We're not going to go clockwise because that's incorrect. Rather, we are going to wrap all the way from minus 360. Uh, I'll do this in a different color here. We're going to wrap from minus 360, which is here, and we're going to wrap all the way around to minus 90 in this counterclockwise fashion. However, through that span of that angle, we, we are shrinking in magnitude from 3 all the way down to 0. So instead of looking like a 3 quarter circle like this, what we actually end up uh, having is a Nyquist plot that follows that same angular trajectory but the the magnitude is shrinking all the time so actually the distance from the origin continues to shrink until we reach our phase angle of negative 90 degrees okay so one more time we started at an angle of uh, started at a magnitude of 3 ended up with a magnitude of 0 as we span through an angle of minus 360 all the way up through minus 270 to minus 180, all the way to minus 90 degrees. Okay, again, we have to label our key points. So this expresses the frequency response from zero plus up to positive infinity. We need to indicate the direction of increasing omega, as always. And then to get the complete Nyquist plot, we have to mirror about the real axis, and that will that would give us the frequencies from minus fi infinity all the way up to zero minus. Okay, so this becomes our complete Nyquist plot here. Again, we applied the exact same process as the previous example. There was just more to this one, right? The process is identical, but there are just more things that we have to keep track of. Okay, so what I'm trying to illustrate here is uh, specifically the process to follow and how you can get um, uh, decent results if you follow the process regardless of how uh, sort of complex it gets. Now before we jump into uh, introduction to the Nyquist stability criterion I do need to mention that method 2 only works for so-called uh, uh, monotonic systems. So this method where we don't need the Bode plots, monotonic systems only. Right? What that means is the Bode uh, magnitude and or the Bode phase both need to be monotonic. In other words, if it's monotonically increasing, that means that the, so we'll do a couple of examples here. Okay, so, so a monotonically increasing uh, magnitude would be one that it's either flat or it's increasing, like so. A monotonically decreasing Bode magnitude, which means it's either flat or decreasing, right? Uh, same goes for the phase. Monotonically increasing phase means it's either uh, 
zero or it's always increasing like so. Monotonically decreasing means it's either zero or the phase is decreasing. Okay, Method two only works for these types of systems. As a counterpoint, method two will not work method two will not work for a case that looks like this. Right? A, a, a Bode magnitude plot that looks like this is not monotonic because, say for a resident peak, for some portion the magnitude increases and for another portion it decreases, like so. Right? So this is not monotonic here. And the same could be said about the phase. If you have any phase plots where it, it both increases and decreases, method two does not actually apply. Um, and the reason, of course, is because you're, you're missing a lot of the intermediate frequencies. And so you're missing a little bit of dynamics there um, when we try to apply method two, specifically because method two, if you look at this table, it really only uh, considers two points. It considers the endpoints. Uh, zero and positive infinity. So on the Bode plot itself, we're really only considering really low frequencies and really high frequencies. And if the system happens to be monotonic, we can deduce um, or, or uh, infer what the magnitudes and phases are doing between those endpoints. But for a system that's non-monotonic, uh, zero plus is here, positive infinity is out here, we're missing this set of dynamics here. We're missing this whole resonant peak because a method 2 doesn't consider all of the intermediate um, dynamics. Okay, so method, method 2 only works for monotonic systems. Um, that's just one sort of caveat to this uh, method. But otherwise it's a very useful method. I, I would argue that it's faster than sketching the Bode plot um, and perhaps more intuitive uh, as well because you're developing the magnitude and phase functions directly. Okay, so with method two kind of uh, under our belt now, uh, we've got two methods for sketching the Nyquist plot. Um, and at this point, you are probably starting to wonder uh, why. Why do we need to sketch the Nyquist plot in order to do control design? Okay, and that's, um, that's where this next um, segment of the lecture is going to, uh, is going to address that. Okay. Um, the final uh, control design tool that we're going to pick up this uh, semester is something called the Nyquist Stability Criterion. Um, it is basically a frequency domain control design tool for guaranteeing closed loop stability. Right? So it's pretty powerful. Um, as I mentioned before, um, uh, you know, its counterpart in the time domain is the Ruth Stability Criterion, which is arguably relatively straightforward compared to the Nyquist Stability Criterion. Um, but as we'll dis discuss in the future, the Nyquist stability criterion is much more powerful. Um, it gives us the ability to analyze the gain and phase margins for one, um, which translate to uh, essentially the robustness of a system, which is something that you don't get from the Ruth stability test. Okay, So there's a little bit of motivation there for why we're going to study the Nyquist stability criterion. Uh, ultimately, it's actually relatively... Uh, elegant, I would call it, right? The Nyquist stability criterion is this. Uh, it's very simple. Z is equal to P minus N. Of course, we need to define what these values are, uh, and hopefully in doing so, we will sort of motivate why we need the Nyquist plot. Okay, so Z is defined as the number of unstable closed-loop poles. P is defined as the number of unstable open loop poles. And N is defined as, and this is the kicker here, the number of counterclockwise encirclements about the point negative 1 on the Nyquist plot. Okay, so this is the whole reason that we have spent the last lecture and a half learning how to sketch the Nyquist plot is because in the Nyquist stability criterion we need to uh, determine what that value n is. Okay, now to determine encirclements, um, you've got to look at the Nyquist plot. Okay, so let's just, uh, for example, 
you know, sketch uh, a sample Nyquist plot that looks something like this. I don't know, maybe it's like this, and the value negative one is here. Okay, so this Nyquist plot kind of does this double loop about the origin, uh, approximately. An encirclement about negative one can be determined by looking at sort of the overall number of loops that there are in the Nyquist plot. So, so this Nyquist plot encircles the value negative one on the real axis a total of two times in a counterclockwise fashion. Um, one way to look at this is you can sort of draw a line out from any point on uh, uh, from any point starting at negative one outward and you can see how many times a Nyquist plot crosses that uh, from right to left or left to right and that's one way to determine the number of encirclements right so for this Nyquist plot for example n is equal to two counterclockwise encirclements about uh, the point negative one okay uh, the the motivation for why why it's negative one uh, this comes from essentially the derivation of the Nyquist stability criterion which uh, I used to do in a separate lecture, but it essentially it took up the entire hour just to motivate why it's this value of negative one. Um, the short answer is the Nyquist stability criterion is based around a mathematical principle called uh, a mathematical construct called the Cauchy's argument principle, which has to do with contour mapping. And so we take that same concept and apply it to control system design, where you know. We need to have our poles in the left half plane of the S plane in order to guarantee stability, and our closed loop transfer function generally has a 1 plus CP in the denominator. Um, those two things e eventually work out to having to circle, uh, having to have encirclements about negative 1 in the Nyquist plot to apply it to the Nyquist stability criterion. So that's a very brief summary of, of where that comes from. Uh, if you have questions, we can talk about that more um, offline, and I can explain that to you in more detail. But uh, our goal for today is just to learn how to use the Nyquist stability criterion, uh, which itself is is uh, not trivial. So we're going to get we're going to get through this lecture so that you learn how to use this. Uh, the main idea, right? The the main idea here is well, looking at the form of the Nyquist stability criterion here. Uh, if you're trying to apply this to guarantee closed loop stability, uh, generally you want the z to equal zero, right? You you want zero unstable closed loop poles. Um, that's the the goal here. If you're trying to get z to equal zero, um, p you get this from the open loop transfer function, right? So you get you get p just by looking at the poles of uh, c times p. Right, so c times p is the open loop transfer function when we're looking at unity feedback. Um, so you just look at the un unstable poles of c times p to get uh, this value, uh, this parameter p. And then the whole idea here is um, you've got to get this n value from the Nyquist plot. Right? And as it turns out, this n value is somewhat adjustable based on your choice of the gain parameter k. Right? So based on your choice of control gain, this value of n in the Nyquist stability criterion is actually uh, somewhat adjustable. Okay? And so we'll see what that means in just a minute through our uh, first example. Okay, so going way back to our roots here, uh, we're going we're gonna to basically do some control design using this new Nyquist stability criterion. So we've got our unity feedback control structure. We have a, uh, a very simple controller. So we'll start again with a just a proportional controller and we have a plant transfer function of 1 over s minus 1. Okay, the one of the first things you may want to do when using the Nyquist stability criterion is just to compute the open loop transfer function which is just c times p. Okay, so it's just going to be L of s is equal to k over s minus 1. Okay, that's our open loop transfer function. Um, what I want you to be very careful of here is uh, we just got finished with doing the root locus analysis where I used the similar notation of L, but for the root locus 
that L represents that very special transfer function. Once you write, uh, write once you write your characteristic function one plus cp equals zero in that special form of one plus k l of s equals zero. This is what you used uh, to determine the root locus using the rules zero through five, right? This is almost never equal to c times p. In fact, it's never equal to c times p for the root locus. Okay, so the root locus is a special case where the L of s related to the root locus is just this whatever left over in, uh, after writing um, the characteristic function in this special form. For mostly, for most all other scenarios, and uh, including the Nyquist stability criterion, L of s is the open loop transfer function, which equals c times p. Okay, so I understand that can be confusing, and I should probably update the notation, but uh, that's where we're at now. Okay, so L of s for the Nyquist plot is just c times p, in which case we've got k over s minus one, uh, which means right away in the Nyquist stability criterion, right? So z equals p minus n. We can determine that p is equal to one. There is one unstable open loop pole, so p is equal to one in the Nyquist stability criterion. Okay. Uh, what we need to do is actually to sketch the Nyquist plot so that we can figure out what n is and then uh, determine closed loop stability. Okay, so we can use, let's use method 2 again to sketch this Nyquist plot, assuming that this L of s is monotonic, which it is. Okay, so let's get our Nyquist plot. Uh, what we're going to do is write L of j omega, which means just replace s with j omega everywhere we see it. So we've got k over j omega minus 1. Again, everywhere we see a complex value, we're going to go ahead and replace that with an exponential counterpart. So we'll call it r e to the j theta. And then factor out, right? Write this whole thing as one big exponential function. So factor out the magnitudes, k over r. And then we have e to the j. Now we want to move this exponential to the numerator. So we'll change the sign of the exponent. Okay, so now we have again an expression for the magnitude and an expression for the phase. Okay, so we're just going to let that sit there for a minute. That's sort of the first step to sketching the Nyquist plot using method two. If you recall, the next step is to sketch out our A contour. So our A contour is simply an S plane where we plot all the poles and zeros of L of S and there's only one unstable pole, oops, there's only one unstable pole uh, of L of S here, okay, it's just at negative one. What we have to do is to sketch rays from our poles and zeros to some arbitrary point on the imaginary axis and label our angles and our magnitudes. Next step is to uh, construct a table which will tabulate what's going on with r and theta as we slide that point from omega equals zero plus all the way up to positive infinity. So we've got r and theta. If you imagine this point way down by the origin, well at that point omega is close to zero plus, r is equal to one, and theta equals 180. As we slide that point up to infinity, well, the magnitude r approaches infinity, and the phase angle approaches 90 degrees. Once we're done doing that for all the r's and thetas, we now get to apply our magnitude and phase functions from above. So the magnitude of L is k over r. The phase of L is negative of theta. So just applying the information in the rows above, k over r for small values of omega is approximately equal to k over 1. So we just have k. As we slide that frequency up to infinity, we've got k over a value that approaches infinity, so the magnitude's going to approach 0. For the phase, we're going to slide that point all the way back down to the origin. We've got a phase angle of 180, but the phase function itself is negative of that, so it's negative 180 up to negative 90.
Now it's important again to consider the direction of rotation. So to get from a value of negative 180, which is here, to a value of negative 90, which is here, I've got to, again, add degrees. Right? So negative 180 plus 90 degrees gives me negative 90. By virtue of adding degrees, I'm actually rotating in a counterclockwise fashion. Right? So that's the important part there. Once I have those bottom two rows, I'm essentially ready to sketch the Nyquist plot. Okay, so on the on the Nyquist plot, I've got the following, and this is interesting because this is the first time we're seeing a value, uh, a variable in the Nyquist plot itself. So considering only positive values of k, right? If k is only allowed to be positive values, uh, which is generally the assumption, we have that for for uh, low frequencies or small frequencies close to zero, we have a magnitude of k at a phase angle of minus 180 degrees. Okay, so the distance from the origin is k, but we're actually on the negative real axis because we're at, starting at minus 180. Okay, so this is, we're going to call that minus k. That's zero plus. And then as we uh, sweep through all the positive frequencies, the magnitude approaches zero. So again, we're going to end at the origin, but we're going to sweep through this angle of minus 180 to minus 90. Okay, so this is the sort of quadrant where all the action is going to take place because our endpoints are minus 180 and minus 90. If you can imagine sweeping through this angle, while at the same time the magnitude is shrinking to zero, you end up with this sort of semicircular shape. Okay. So this is what the first half of the Nyquist plot looks like. And again, we've got to indicate uh, our key frequencies and our direction of increasing omega. We also need to mirror to get the complete, to get the complete closed contour from minus infinity up to zero minus. Okay, so this becomes our complete Nyquist plot here. Now this is interesting. This highlights a new uh, concept here which is once you incorporate controllers into your system, the Nyquist plot will also be a function of that k value. Okay, so what you see here is that as you change the value of k, the Nyquist plot essentially is scaled about the origin. It sort of expands and contracts about the origin. And this is what I meant earlier by you have some adjustability on the, on the, uh, the parameter n in the Nyquist stability criterion. What I mean by that is imagine if k is a value that's larger than 1. Let's say k is equal to negative, uh, let's say k itself is equal to 2. Now this intersection point here is negative 2, which puts the value of negative 1 inside of that circle, and therefore we've got the Nyquist plot encircles this point negative 1 in a counterclockwise fashion one time. Okay, so we'll just do a couple of test points here. If k equals 2, then n is equal to 1. Right? But if k is smaller than that, if, let's say k is equal to 1 half. If k equals 1 half, then this intersection point here is actually equal to negative 1 half. And therefore, the value negative 1 is somewhere outside of that circle. In that case, there are no encirclements of the Nyquist plot about this point negative 1. So n is equal to 0 in that scenario. Okay, so you can see how the value of k can somewhat influence the number of encirclements in the uh, Nyquist plot because of the nature of the k value is to expand or contract the Nyquist plot about the origin. In this control design example, You've got to go back to the Nyquist stability criterion, which says that z equals p minus n. Okay, so z equals p minus n. For this example, p was equal to 1. Right? We, we started with one unstable open loop pole. <coughs> okay, what we want, right, we want z to be equal to 0, and that would guarantee us closed loop stability. If we want z to be equal to 0, then we also we also want n to be equal to 1. Okay? And n is equal to 1 
for all values of k actually greater than 1. Right? Anytime, is k, anytime k is greater than 1, you're going to have the scenario where this counterclockwise circle is outside of the value negative 1. So for any value of k greater than 1, you're going to have this picture, and therefore n is going to equal to, uh, be equal to 1. Okay, n is equal to 1 as long as k is greater than 1. And so this ultimately gives us our uh, stability criteria. Right? This gives us our stability criteria. Right? So this is ultimately the answer, but the logic starts way back here with that we want z to be equal to 0. P is P kind of is what it is. You can't do anything about that. Those are open loop poles. And so our goal is to choose our k such that we get the n that we want in order to produce z equals 0. Okay, so this is our first example of how to use uh, the Nyquist stability criterion to do actual control design. Okay, so hopefully so far, uh, there's a lot of new stuff going on here, but so far, hopefully everything is relatively straightforward. I've given you a couple of processes to sketch the Nyquist plot, um, and then I've introduced the idea of the Nyquist stability criterion, which is another control design tool. Um, if all of this makes sense so far, that's great. Um, I did promise you that the Nyquist stability criterion is conceptually going to be one of the most challenging topics in the course. Uh, and, and this is why. Nyquist plots are going to be very, very tricky when L of S has poles at the origin. Okay, uh, This, I think, is probably what makes this concept the most challenging of all, right? Everything so far seems pretty straightforward. You just follow the process to get the Nyquist plot. Uh, the one little caveat here is when L of S has uh, one or more poles at the origin. Okay, so we're just going to step through this, uh, you know, you know, bit by bit, uh, and try and follow the same process that we've been following. Uh, but we're going to see that there's some very strange things that happen here. Okay. So let's look at, let's just try and sketch the Nyquist plot for for this guy here. Okay, so we're going to try and sketch the Nyquist plot for L of S equals 1 over S times S plus 1. Uh, and we're going to apply method 2, um, just like we've been doing all lecture. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is uh, get our frequency response function, which means to plug in J omega everywhere we see S. Okay, so far so good, nothing tricky here. Okay, now we want to express this in exponential form, which means everywhere we see a complex number, we want to replace that with an exponential counterpart. Like so. Still, nothing's different, we're just following the procedure, right? Okay. Once we do that, we want to group all these together into one big exponential function. Okay, so we're going to factor out the r1 and r2, and we're going to have e to the j. We want to move both of these up to the numerator, so we've got minus theta 1, minus theta 2, like so. Okay, so we've got our frequency response function handled. We have our expression for the magnitude and the phase of L of j omega, which is good. That's right where we want to be. Moving forward, the next step in the process is to sketch out our A contour, which again, we're just going to map all of the poles and zeros of L of S. So we have, okay, we've got a pole at the origin now. We've got a pole at the origin and a pole at negative 1 here. We need to sketch rays from those points to an arbitrary point on the imaginary axis, and then we're going to label carefully, right? R1 theta 1 corresponds to the pole at the origin. So this is R1, this is theta 1, R2 theta 2 is here. Okay, so far so good. Nothing's too crazy yet. And then we're going to make our table to see what happens as we increase frequency from 0 plus up to positive infinity. And we're going to find here that hopefully what you find is that this notation of 0 plus and 0 minus starts to come into play, starts to come into handy. Uh, 
starts to come in handy. <laughs> okay, so we got to we got to tabulate R1, R2, theta1 and theta2. We need to see what's going on with these parameters as we slide this point up from the origin up to positive infinity. When this point is very close to the origin, R1 is basically 0. R2 is equal to 1. Theta1 is approximately 90. No, theta1 is exactly 90, and theta2 is approximately 0. Okay, as we slide that point up to infinity, uh, we're going to have that R1 and R2 both approach infinity, and theta1 and theta2 both approach 90 degrees. Okay, still, so far so good, nothing too different. Okay, now as usual, we're going to apply our magnitude and phase functions here. 1 over R1, R2 is the magnitude function, so when omega is close to 0, we've got 1 over 0 times 1 that's a very huge number, right? So we're going to basically approximate that at infinity. This is strange. We haven't seen this before, a magnitude of infinity, but that's fine. We're going to keep moving along with this process. Um, as omega approaches infinity, we've got 1 over infinity squared, so the magnitude approaches 0. For the phase, we have negative theta 1 minus theta 2, which is negative 90. And then we have minus 180 as omega approaches infinity. Okay, The direction of rotation here, so here's minus 90, here's minus 180. To get from point A to point B, we're actually going to subtract numbers. So in this case, we have clockwise rotation. Now, the thing that's going to happen here is that normally, when we get to this point of these bottom two rows, usually we can go straight to our Nyquist plot. Okay, usually we can just jump straight into our Nyquist plot. But you can see, if we tried to do that here, let's see what happens if we try and do that right here. When omega is close to zero, we're at a phase angle of negative 90, which is somewhere on the negative imaginary axis, at a magnitude of infinity. So we're somewhere on the imaginary axis. We'll just call this value, you know, minus infinity. So very, very far down the imaginary axis. Uh, on the imaginary axis. So that's the, that's the key point here. The assumption is that we're on the imaginary axis. Uh, as, we, as we pan through this angle of minus 90 to minus 180, our magnitude is just shrinking to zero. So it might appear that, it might appear that the Nyquist plot just kind of rides along the negative imaginary axis until it gets to the origin. And that's what, that's what you would get if you went straight off this bottom two rows, right? That's exactly what you would get. Now the only problem is, any time you have a pole at the origin, this is the Nyquist plot that you would get, because you're always going to have a magnitude of infinity somewhere. Okay, So you're always going to be riding along one of the imaginary axes, uh, and that's just incorrect. right? The Nyquist plots have to be different when the, when the plant changes. Okay, um, so, so it turns out there's a piece of information that we're missing here. And in previous cases, we didn't need to consider it because 0 minus always mapped to 0 plus. But in this case, we have this strange business of this magnitude of infinity. So, so when L of S has poles at the origin, there's one additional computation that we have to do. And that is, we have to consider the real component of L of j omega at omega equals zero. Okay, what it means is it's not just going to be on the negative imaginary axis. There's going to be a little bit of offset because the real component of that point is non-zero. Okay, here's what I mean by that. We have to compute the real component of L of j omega evaluated at omega equals zero plus. We This is going to be a non-zero value that we have to compute in order to sketch the proper Nyquist plot. Okay, What this means for you, unfortunately, is you have to actually do this computation. You have to evaluate the real part of L of j omega, which means you need to write L of j omega as a real component plus an imaginary component. Okay, So up here we did this work to get things in exponential form. Unfortunately, you actually need to also express this in uh, 
sort of traditional form or Cartesian form as real plus imaginary. So what we're going to do is start here, okay, we're going to start here and express L of j omega as real plus imaginary. So L of j omega is equal to 1 over j omega times 1 plus omega j, right? Now this is a strategy that you, you've already seen it once in the root locus where you need to write L of j omega as real plus imaginary. This is actually the second time you're going to need that computation. So, so hopefully you get very comfortable with expressing L of j omega as real plus imaginary. Uh, but it boils down to just conjugating the denominator uh, so that you guarantee a real value in the denominator. And then you just separate the numerator until it's real, uh, into its real and imaginary uh, components. Okay, so what we need to do is multiply top and bottom by minus j omega and also by 1 minus omega j, like so. Okay, this is going to guarantee us a real value denominator because complex conjugate, uh, the product of complex conjugates is always a real value. Okay, so what we're going to end up with here is the denominator will look like okay, j omega times negative j omega that should just give us a real value, which is omega squared. 1 plus omega j plus times 1 minus omega j, that's going to give us 1 plus omega squared. Okay, so all this denominator is now real. In the numerator, we have uh, negative j omega times 1, which is minus j omega, times, uh, I'm sorry, plus omega squared times j squared, which is minus omega squared. All right, so in the numerator, we've got some real and imaginary components, but our denominator is purely real. So now we can just separate out these components. I'll keep all the real stuff here, minus omega squared, minus, now there was a omega j over here, over the same denominator, omega squared times 1 plus omega squared, and I'll write it this way. So we've got our real component and our imaginary component. So we've just written L of j omega, the same complex valued frequency response now as real plus imaginary. So we can, at this point, clean this up a little. We can cancel this guy here and we'll just get minus 1 over omega squared plus 1 and also in the imaginary component, one of these omegas can, can be canceled as well. So we can simplify in this way too. Uh, we're going to need this a couple of times, okay? So it's always important to be able to re uh, express L of j omega as real plus imaginary. For this problem, we need to evaluate the real part of L of j omega, which is this part, at omega equals 0 plus. Okay, so L of j omega, I'm uh, sorry, the real part of L of j omega evaluated at omega equals 0 is minus 1 over 1 plus 0 squared. I'm just plugging in omega equals 0 uh, to the real component here. And this gives me a value of minus 1. Okay, this is the key, one of the, one of the key components of dealing with transfer functions with poles at the origin is that there's this third piece uh, to the puzzle, which is another data point uh, at omega equals 0 plus. Okay, so in addition to just the magnitude, all right, so, so for omega equals 0 plus, in addition to just the magnitude being infinite, the phase being negative 90, we also have that there's a real component that's equal to negative 1. And this is the piece of the puzzle that's going to allow us to sketch the more accurate Nyquist plot. Okay, so here's our B contour. This is our Nyquist plot uh, on the S-plane. Uh, what we had, again, is a magnitude of infinity, so we're at a distance from the origin of infinity, which is strange already, at a phase angle of negative 90, so that puts us way down on the negative imaginary axis, but at that same frequency, omega equals 0 plus, we have a real component that's negative 1. So we're not actually on the negative real axis, we're slightly offset. And I'm going to draw this uh, extremely not to scale, I'm going to draw it here just for effect, and I'll use different colors like I've been using. Okay, so this represents omega equals zero plus, and I'll show you what I mean by extremely not to scale. Um, in this picture, well actually in this picture, 
the distance from the origin, right? The magnitude, that's infinity, right? But the real component right here, that's negative 1. Okay, so I'm saying that this distance here is inf infinite, this distance here is 1. So this is very, very not to scale, but you kind of have to draw it this way in order to see the effect of, uh, uh, of your computations, okay? So this point here corresponds to 0 plus, not the point on the imaginary axis. From this point, now we can carry out our, our uh, analysis of what's going on between 0 and omega equals infinity. Okay, the magnitude starts at infinity and shrinks to 0. Phase angle starts at negative 90 and uh, sweeps to negative 180. Okay? So because this picture is so out of scale, I'm assuming that this angle right here, I'm assuming that that's negative 90, right? Even though visually it's not, we're approximating that at negative 90 because uh, of this real component. And so from negative 90, we're going to sweep from there to negative 180, which is on the negative real axis, while at the same time recall that the magnitude is shrinking from infinity to zero. So we're going to end up at the origin through this sort of path right here. Okay, so you can imagine that we're just sweeping through this angle from negative 90 to 0, while at the same time the distance from the origin is perpetually decreasing until we get to the origin. Okay, It's a little bit tricky. You kind of have to think about this. You may have to stare at this for a minute to fully grasp this concept. Okay, But this is ultimately what our Nyquist plot is going to look like, or at least the first half of it. This is 0 plus, and this is positive infinity here. Okay, and again, this point here is minus 1, so it's very not to scale at all. Okay, now remember, the Nyquist plot must be a closed contour. So generally, we, we close a contour by uh, mirroring about the real axis. So in this case, if we mirror this about the real axis, we get this shape, where this should map to minus uh, infinity up to what we're going to call 0 minus, okay? So we're not quite out of the woods yet because we're not finished. This is not a closed contour. So this is another reason that uh, systems with poles at the origin can get very tricky because while minus infinity maps to the a common point positive infinity, minus a 0 minus does not map to 0 plus as it has in all previous problems. Okay, so the last piece of the puzzle is to simply figure out how does 0 minus map to 0 plus. And remember, these are both points floating out at infinity. That's, that's, just, that's just weird, right? So we need to figure out how these two points map to each other. In order to do that, in order to do that, we have to revisit our A contour way up here, okay? We've got to revisit this guy. Remember what we were doing in this portion of the problem is trying to figure out what all of the r's and thetas are doing as we map omega from 0 plus up to positive infinity. Okay, What that means is very, very close to the origin. right? So 0 plus means very close to the origin, but not quite all the way there. Right? It just means very small, but still slightly positive. Okay, and we did that for a reason, and the reason is to account for when there's a pole at the origin. Okay, so, so what we need to do is actually make an assumption about this pole at the origin. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is make an assumption. Is this pole stable or unstable? Okay, the Nyquist plot doesn't account for marginal stability, so we actually have to just choose. Right? Are we feeling that this pole at the origin is stable or not? And once we make that assumption, Okay, then we can move forward with our analysis. I'll try and resketch what the A contour looks like here so that we have it side by side when I do the next portion. Right, we had pull at negative 1, pull right here at the origin, some arbitrary point here, and so forth, like this. Right, like, like so. And then we, uh, the counterpart to this was to make a table that tells us what happens from 0 plus to positive infinity, right? That's what we were doing up above. Um, what we need to do now is to decide, is this pole at the origin 
stable or unstable. Okay, and that's going to drive the remainder of the problem, is that assumption. So somewhere, somewhere we need to make that assumption. Um, for the first part of the example, we will assume um, that uh, s equals zero is stable. Ultimately, we're going to find that either, no matter what assumption you make, you'll get the same answer, but you, you need to be consistent through your assumption all the way to the end of the problem. Okay, so we're going to assume the pole at the origin is stable. That's the key. That's the key to all of this. Okay, uh, the pole at the origin is stable. What that means, okay, is this pole right here at the origin. Uh, based on our assumption here, that means that this should be in the left half plane, right? That's that's the argument here, is that the pole at the origin, if that's stable, it should be in the left half plane. So if we were to, say, zoom way into the origin, zoom way in, right? We're going to zoom way, 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 way in. We can actually sketch what the A contour looks like when we're extremely zoomed in. So when we're extremely zoomed in, you've got the pole at the origin, right? The pole at the origin is right there. But because we're saying that the pole at the origin is stable, this pole needs to exist in the left half plane, which means it needs to be to the left of the uh, imaginary axis. Okay, what it means for us is, well, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to take the imaginary axis at points very close to the origin, and we're just going to move it to the side. Okay, this is strange. We're just going to bend the imaginary axis around to the right, such that all this stuff here is now the left half plane, right? right? There's nothing saying we can't move our axes mathematically, right? So we're going to take that liberty here and just bend the imaginary axis so the pole is now in the left half plane, okay? I'll let you pause the video just to digest that piece of information because that's crazy what we're doing here, right? However, there's nothing mathematically that's stopping us from doing that, okay? So again, the assumption is that the pole at the origin is stable, therefore we bend the imaginary axis to the right, which places that pole at the origin right there in the left half plane. We're going to call this the A prime contour, okay? because it's essentially the A contour here, but we're just extremely zoomed in to the origin. right? So the pole at negative 1 that's depicted here, on the A prime contour it doesn't even show up because it's so far to the left that we can't see it, right? because we're that far zoomed in. Recall that now we can actually see where 0 plus and 0 minus are on the imaginary axis, right? Because we're so far zoomed in, we can actually see a, a visible gap between 0 and 0 plus, okay? Once you wrap your head around this concept here, right? If, if, you, can, if you can buy this for the moment, then our process for analyzing what's going on is exactly the same, right? Except when we make our table, we're not going to map from 0 plus to positive infinity. We're simply going to map frequencies from 0 minus up to 0 plus. That's the part that changes here, okay? Uh, with a pole at the origin, right, all we're considering here, and we'll call this like L bar, L bar of S, we just have one pole at the origin, right? Because we're so zoomed in, we don't care about the the additional pole at negative one. So our analysis is going to be based on this sort of uh, special L bar, which is just the pole at the origin. However, our analysis remains identical to before. We're going to basically repeat method two all over again just for this pole at the origin. We're going to plug in S equals J omega. So we're going to get one over J omega. We're going to write L bar of j omega in exponential form. So 1 over r e to the j theta. And just to differentiate this computation from the, from the main computation, instead of r e to the j theta, I'm just going to say epsilon, which is a tiny, tiny value, e to the j. And we'll just call it angle phi. We'll just give it a different angle. 
right? And then we're going to write all of this as one big exponential function. So we'll factor out the 1 over epsilon, move the exponent up to the numerator, so change the sign, like so. And now we've got, just like before, a, an expression for the magnitude and phase of this new function, L bar. Okay. We're going to set this aside as we normally do, and we're going to visit our A prime contour, which just as before, we're going to sketch a point, some arbitrary point on the imaginary axis, which remember now takes a semicircular path about the origin, a very tiny semicircle, but it's, it's there nonetheless. And then we need to draw rays from our poles, which is this one here at the origin, out to that uh, point on the imaginary axis. Note the radius or the magnitude and the phase angle, right? So we've got epsilon and phi here, and then we're going to tabulate over here on this table what's going on with epsilon uh, and phi. Okay, when, remember, we're not mapping from 0 plus to positive infinity anymore. We're mapping from 0 minus, which is way down here, up to 0 plus, which is way up here. So when omega is 0 minus, this point on the imaginary axis is actually close to this point down here. At that point, epsilon, which is just the radius or the magnitude, uh, the distance from the pole to that point on the imaginary axis, that's just constant because we've drawn a semicircular path around that pole. Uh, the phase angle, however, is negative 90 degrees because we're down here close to 0 minus. As we sweep that point along the imaginary axis from 0 minus up to 0 plus, epsilon stays the same. It's just a constant radius throughout this whole path, but the phase eventually ends up at positive 90, right? Positive 90 degrees. Okay, and that's it. That's, that's all epsilon and phi are doing through that span of 0 minus to 0 plus. Now, just like before, we're going to employ our magnitude and phase functions for this new special L-bar transfer function here. So the magnitude is 1 over epsilon, so 1 over a very, very tiny value is infinity, and that's going to be the same from 0 minus to 0 plus, infinity to infinity, and that's actually a good thing, because remember, on the actual Nyquist plot, we're trying to figure out how this value of at, a, at an infinite a distance maps to this value at an infinite distance. Okay, so this is good so far. Uh, the phase is given as minus phi, right, from our frequency response function. So minus phi, that gives me actually 90 to negative 90. And the most important piece about this um, analysis here is the, the direction of rotation. Okay, so 90 degrees is up here. Negative 90 is down here. To get from this point up here down to this point, I have to, I've got to uh, subtract degrees. I have to subtract numbers, right, to get from the value 90 to negative 90. So this gives me clockwise rotation, clockwise rotation from 90 to negative 90. And that's the key, that's the absolute key to this part of the problem, is that the mapping from 0 minus to 0 plus on the Nyquist plot takes place at a value of infinity through a clockwise rotation. Let's see what that looks like as we finish up our Nyquist plot up here. Okay, so we just found that the mapping finds 0 minus, so 0 minus is actually way, way up here on the B contour. Mapping from 0 minus to 0 plus occurs at a distance of infinity, but through a clockwise rotation. So clockwise is this way clockwise is this way. And so we're going from 0 minus to 0 plus at a radius of, of 1 over epsilon, which is essentially an infinite radius in a clockwise rotation. Okay, this is, this is the most challenging concept in the entire class, I would argue. Okay, this is a complete closed contour and an accurate and complete Nyquist plot at this point.
Okay, remember all of this started with this assumption that the pole at the origin is stable. Okay, um, from the Nyquist stability standpoint, which says that z is equal to p minus n. Okay, this is always going to be consistent whether you choose stable or unstable. And we can see how with a very uh, uh, brief sort of explanation here. Okay, if the pole at the origin is stable, then looking at our original transfer function way up here, we find that we have a stable pole at negative 1 and a stable pole at the origin because that's what we're assuming. So there are zero unstable poles in the open loop transfer function. So as far as the Nyquist stability criterion is con concerned, p is equal to zero. Okay, there are zero unstable poles. The corresponding Nyquist plot based on this assumption is what we sketched up here. Okay, We have this clockwise uh, uh, connection from zero minus to zero plus. The value negative one is over here. So, looking at this Nyquist plot, there are no encirclements of this Nyquist plot about this point negative 1 here. So, based on this assumption, n equals 0 as well. And so, therefore, we get that z equals 0. Okay? Let's just see, for the, for, for the sake of completeness, what happens if we made the opposite assumption. Okay? If we make the opposite assumption, well, the first part of the Nyquist plot doesn't change at all, right? The first part where we have this sort of from 0 plus to positive infinity, from minus infinity up to 0 minus, that doesn't change. The only part that changes is the mapping from 0 minus to 0 plus if we change our assumption. So, just for the sake of completeness, let's now assume s equals 0 is unstable. Okay, assume that it's unstable. Okay, what that means is for z is equal to p minus n, that means that we now have one unstable pole because we're considering the pole at the origin to be unstable. Okay, let's go through this same argument here but change a couple of things. Okay, if we assume the pole at the origin is unstable, then, and I'll make these changes in a different color here, then the way that we would have bent the imaginary axis would not have been around to the right. It would have been this way. Okay? So it would have been this way because we want this pole at the origin to agree with our assumption that the pole is unstable. So we need it to exist in the right half plane. Okay? All of this stuff where we analyze the pole at the origin, this remains the same. The, the key difference here is that when we make our table, okay, so we draw rays to an arbitrary point on the imaginary axis, so we have epsilon, and our angle is still defined as phi, the angle from the positive real. When we, when we make our table, okay, epsilon remains epsilon through the range of 0 minus to 0 plus. However, the key difference here is that when this point is slid back along the imaginary axis here to something close to 0 plus, phi is not negative 90. It's actually 270. Right? We've actually started from 0, wrapped around all the way 270 to get to this point on the uh, imaginary axis. And that's the key difference here. This negative 90 changes to 270 when we assume the pole is unstable. And as we sweep through this range of angles, we go from 270 down through minus 180 all the way down to, neg uh, to 90. So this 90 stays the same. The difference is that the starting point is now 270 rather than negative 90 because we've had to pre-wind around this positive direction to get uh, to that point on the imaginary axis. What that does downstream is it changes Okay, so, so the remember the phase function is minus phi. This minus 270 becomes, uh, this, this 270 here becomes minus 270 in the phase. Okay, so the analysis here kind of changes because 
the angle minus 270, here's 0, here's minus 90, here's minus 180, here's minus 270. To get from minus 270 to minus 90, which is here, we actually have to add degrees back to get to that point. This changes the direction of rotation. So the direction of rotation becomes counterclockwise. And that's the key difference between assuming the pole at the origin is stable versus unstable. Because now, our Nyquist plot, right? the first part of the Nyquist plot, which looked like this, the first part of our Nyquist plot looked like this, and now, with our assumption being that the pole at the origin is unstable, we have a mapping from 0 minus to 0 plus that occurs at a value of infinity in a counterclockwise fashion. And that's the key difference here. 0 minus is here. 0 plus is here. They're both at distances of infinity. But the mapping, according to this assumption, is now that it's counterclockwise. Counterclockwise rotation from 0 minus up to 0 plus. And this changes everything because now the value negative 1 is about here. Now looking at this Nyquist plot we have that we have that n equals 1 because the Nyquist plot encircles the value negative 1 in a counterclockwise fashion one time. Which means that our n here becomes 1 as well. However, because of that assumption that the pole is unstable, we have 1 minus 1 is equal to 0, which gives us the same outcome as when we made the other assumption, only instead of 1 minus 1, we ended up with 0 minus 0. Okay, so it doesn't really matter what assumption you make. As far as the Nyquist stability criteria is concerned, the outcome is going to remain the same. The only difference is that when you have poles at the origin, the overall shape of the Nyquist plot is entirely dependent on your assumption. Right? So this Nyquist plot is purely, uh, purely looks this way because we assume the pole at the origin is unstable. Right? The Nyquist plot completely changes when we make the opposite assumption. Right? So this Nyquist plot is valid for the assumption that the pole at the origin is stable. Right? So that's the part that changes is the Nyquist plot, but the Nyquist stability criterion outcome should never change depending on your uh, depending on your assumption. Okay, so this was a lot. I understand that. It's a very dense lecture. Um, we started relatively straightforward and then very quickly uh, sort of had to go head first into this world of Nyquist plots with poles at the origin. Okay, so uh, so 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 study this and, and sort of let this stuff digest. Um, and the next lecture we're going to pick up uh, essentially how to put all this stuff together to do control design using these Nyquist plots.